Greetings. It's a great pleasure to be able to address you today on a very important topic of risk assessment for varicose vein patients. I know that this is a simple procedure, but uh, unfortunately, uh, some patients are at very high risk. And the purpose of this lecture is to point out to you those few patients who really need to get special consideration. These are my disclosures. Now there's very little uh, uh, doubt about why I'd like to use the Caprini score. And uh, uh, that's not actually because it was developed by us, but it's because it's the most comprehensive history and physical available that's been widely tested throughout the world in surgical patients. It consists of 40 elements. And the number of risk factors, as they go up, the incidence of DVT increases, we know that. And we also know that there's different powers for each risk factor. Some risk factors are very low power, such as bed rest, and others, such as pancreatic or esophageal cancer, very high risk. Well, taking the number of risk factors and also their weights and putting them together, we come up with a very simple number that represents a score that correlates with the incidence of clinical VTE events. As the score rises, so does the incidence of venous thromboembolic disease. Here we see the results in general surgery. And especially when you get over eight, the incidence really tends to jump. The score has been validated in about 5 million patients in over 200 publications now worldwide. And it is a comprehensive tool, as I said, combining the power of the risk factors, the number of the risk factors, and yielding a score. There is one study which we'll talk about uh, that actually has evaluated over two year period, almost 3 million surgical patients. And again, showing that same escalation in score and incidence of DVT. There are a few studies out there, of course, that, that are negative studies. And usually the reason for that is that the score wasn't calculated properly. All the questions weren't asked. That's number one. And the most important thing I wanna to emphasize to you all today, you must ask all the questions to find out the full risk of the patient. And then there are a few studies where there are additional uh, procedures, for example, abdominoplasty, that really require um, a, a higher uh, score than we currently have. Now, we know that the big downside of this, the, the upside is the fact that you're collecting a lot of information about your patients. You have a good uh, idea of, of their incidence of and, and the risk of thrombosis. But the bad news is it's hard to collect all that information. So we advocate facilitating the collection uh, by involving the patients in their care. Patients love to get involved in their care. And we want you all to, when, when you're done with this lecture, go huddle with your families and, and fill out the score and then give that score or share it with your personal physician and get that put into your record. That's very, very important. And this is in multiple languages. It's a very straightforward, uh, patient-friendly document. And the reason that you wanna fill this out now is because if you suddenly develop the COVID infection or you're in an auto accident or you have a stroke uh, and you come into the hospital, nobody's gonna ask you all of these questions, especially about how, if your grandmother had a DBT and so forth. They may be rushing around trying to save your life. If that's not in the record, a lot of information will be missed and particularly information regarding in women, obstetrical uh, complications, spontaneous abortion, stillborn, uh, premature birth of uh, children with a lower birth weight, a toxemia of pregnancy. All of these problems clinically may reflect a blood abnormality called the antiphosphate antibody syndrome, which is a very powerful predictor of venous thrombosis. If you're, and these, these uh, events, these defects can occur long after the patient has had their obstetrical misadventures. And if you're not aware of those, that can be difference between a successful varicose vein procedure and a nightmare. Now that by the same token, family history, and it's very, very important that you track the family history. And the reason for that is that again, most people undergoing vein operations, it's, it's very straightforward. They don't have any complications. But if one of these uh, elements is in the background, it may spell the difference between a nice operation and even a death. 
And there are, um, once this information is collected, as you can see here, uh, it's very straightforward. And then it can be reviewed on admission and the admitting person responsible for the history and physical can double check to see about leg swelling and, and edema and so forth and the obstetrical history and the family history is very, very important. And failure to account for this family history. I keep emphasizing this because in a lot of times I'm consulted for patients that have simple procedures and they die and people want to know why. And the reason in many of those cases is nobody looked at the patient's family history. And we know from this very large study, which I don't think has received enough publicity, 183,000 patients studied in Scandinavia over a 25 year period with controls. And we see that the incidence of DVT and PE in patients who have no personal history, but have a first degree relative with it are high. They're a little lower for second degree relatives, which is maternal half siblings and nieces and nephews and so forth, but also cousins. Third degree relatives is higher, not as high. It goes down and it's even slightly higher for people that live together. And this can be explained probably because of common lifestyles between people that are uh, living together over long periods of time. Now, minimally invasive surgical procedures uh, have been uh, uh, seen to also be associated with venous thrombosis. And here is an interesting study uh, where there were 985,000 patients looked at, and a total of them uh, met all of this, uh, 130,000 met all the study criteria. 63,000 had multiple procedures, which means of uh, laser ablation and, and uh, 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 other procedures to extract varicose veins, uh, radiofrequency ablation and laser ablation altogether were uh, uh, about 40% of all the procedures. Only 10% of patients had surgery. And what's really important about all of this is take a look at these figures. In patients who had radiofrequency ablation or laser ablation, uh, and especially radiofrequency ablation, 4.86 DVT incidence, 3.4% for the equivalent patients who had surgery. Now take a look at the difference in PE. It's just the other way around. The, TV, the, the PE rate was much lower. So that uh, the DVT rate for ablation in this series uh, was higher than those uh, patients uh, having surgery, but the PT, PE rate was lowered by a, a factor of 50%. And here is a survey that was done. And what is interesting about this survey is 70% of the patients, 70 percent of the respondents used one dose of low molecular weight heparin. And there's no evidence that a single dose of low molecular weight heparin does anything, except in the allergic patient may produce a problem. And it's especially useless in low risk patients. Panucci's meta-analysis of 17 of the early Caprini score trials have shown that in general and vascular surgery and plastic surgery, patients with a score of lower than seven, or, and certainly lower than five, they had a low incidence of venous thrombosis, low molecular weight heparin didn't help them, and they could be spared anticoagulation, very, very important. Whereas patients who are at risk, they don't deserve one shot or two shots, they deserve a full course of, course of therapy shown in clinical trials to be effective, which we all know is seven to 10 days. We've known that for, for 40 years. And in addition to that, patients who are at very high risk may need even prophylaxis beyond that time. Now here was a survey response from 213 institutions. Laser ablation performed in 43,000 patients and they were a very small incidence of e, of e hit uh, in uh, two, three, and four classification, and uh, a DVT in 24 patients and PE in three patients. And in this particular source, uh, series, they stated that sex, age, obesity, origin of the varicose vein, vein diameter, and preoperative Caprini score were not strong indicators of VTE. Very uh, unusual conclusion from all the other work that's been done by other investigators. And there were only a few VTE complications and postoperative ultrasound did not predict severe VTE events. Now, when I reviewed all of these data, 
it was obvious to me that the, the patients were not scored properly and or incomplete information distorted the results of the Caprini score. Let's, let me give you several examples. The first case was a 68 year old woman with a low body may, a BMI who underwent a left greater saphenous vein ablation under local anesthesia and sedation. They scored her as three, two for her age and one for a minor procedure. Actually, it was she had varicose veins. She had an age of over 60 and probably an over 45 minute procedure. So her real score was not three, but five. Another case, 68 year old woman with a low BMI who had both legs done with uh, 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 endovenous uh, laser ablation with a patient under general anesthesia. So they said her score was four, but actually it was six, varicose veins, age, procedure lasting over 45 minutes under general anesthesia and oral contraceptives. So you can see that it's very important. And so in this study, we have no idea if all the questions were asked and we do not see any list of comorbidities. Now let's go to Poland. 141 patients undergoing saphenous vein stripping and mini uh, phlebectomy. And this was uh, along with my uh, dear friend and brilliant colleague, vascular surgeon, Thomas Orbanik uh, from Poland. And thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin, 40 milligrams a day given for 10 days. Bravo, those patients at risk. Duplex scans were reported at 10 and 30 days and five calf vein thrombi were seen. The Caprini score and the VCSS score were statistically significant predictors of postoperative VT, DVT. The authors conclude that risk assessment should be done in all varicose vein patients, and future studies are necessary to confirm these results. We couldn't agree more, but you can't ignore the basic risk assessment of these patients because it's very, very important to pick out those who are at highest risk of complications. Now, here's a wonderful series from the University of Michigan going back to 2015 with these brilliant investigators, Thomas Wakefield, as everyone knows, and, and Andrea Obi. And this was uh, previously published, 1,000 limbs. And uh, perioperatively, 5,000 units of heparin were given. And if the score was over eight, they got one week of low molecular weight heparin. Sound familiar? The period of time known to be efficacious. Immediate ambulation and compression for two weeks and imaging at seven days, three and 12 months, and then yearly. The results showed that there was an incidence of DVT uh, with uh, radiofrequency ablation, and it was higher when the TIPS procedure was added. And uh, the E-hit was low, but was again higher when the TIPS procedure was added. And superficial venous thrombosis was, was uh, again low, but high, over 6% in those patients who had uh, the combination of RFA and TIPS. And there was an improvement in the VCSS score. Now, they felt that ablation of axial reflex with the tips improved the outcomes and should be the first line therapy for varicose veins and venous insufficiency. They used a standardized protocol with a low but uh, uh, incidence of thrombosis, lower DVT rates compared with are compared with the uh, uh, those that are seen in the literature at that time. And it's interesting to note that since that time, now I don't know what's gone in 2020, but certainly throughout all of 2019 there was only one asymptomatic calf vein seen. And I don't think they did anything differently. I just think that this, everything became more refined. Anyway, let's talk about how to assess these patients. If they have varicose veins and they have ablation, that counts as one point, phlebectomy is one point. Varicose veins, they've all got varicose veins, so you have to add that. Leg swelling, history of superficial venous thrombosis or DVT. That's an, they are important factors. And especially remember that although some of these patients may have varicose veins, that patients who, have var who do not have varicose veins and get superficial venous thrombosis. It's a very serious uh, event from the thrombosis standpoint. Family history of DVT, three points, of course, and personal family uh, thrombophilia defect are three, three points. Remember, if the procedures last longer than 45 minutes, they count as two points and not one. Age, again, one, two, or three points, depending on the age. You just pick one of those. Uh, BMI of over 25, one point. That's an important factor that's been shown in patients, uh, both women with on uh, uh, birth control pills and also after hip surgery, that that BMI is critical in determining the incidence of thrombosis. History of cancer, two points. 
That excludes basal cell cancer, but does include uh, squamous or melanoma. Contraceptives or hormonal therapy counts as a point. And remember that tamoxifen is included in that, but aromadex, not necessarily so. Pregnancy or postpartum one month and a history of obstetrical complications, as we talked about, which include those that are mentioned previously, especially spontaneous abortions, uh, unplanned, of course, and uh, stillborns, toxemia, pregnancy, birth limit, birth re reduced infant with uh, uh, problems of that nature, all could be associated with the antifossil antibody syndrome. So here's a suggested schema, and I would put it out to all of you to assess this. This is this this is to be this is to, uh, to be proven and validated and shaped and changed and so forth. Low risk patients don't give them any low molecular weight heparin. Moderate risk patients, uh, we you can use compression stockings. We advocate compression stockings and uh, low molecular weight heparin for seven to ten days because patients who have five a score of five or more are at risk. Patients at risk need a course of therapy. Course of therapy is seven to 10 days. Those patients that are very high risk that uh, should be scanned at 10 days and continued on their low molecular weight heparin, especially if there's any problems. Now, I also adv advocate those people uh, should, uh, with a family history of thrombosis or thrombophilia, should get 14 to 28 days of, of prophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin, regardless of their score. And I would remind you, and this comes back from this beautiful meta-analysis of Panucci, that those people uh, that had low scores had a very low incidence of thrombosis. But if their score was uh, eight or above, 10% of people who didn't get prophylaxis got a clot. And it's very important to use prophylaxis in these patients, especially when that score is over eight. And remember that death from an anti prophylactic anticoagulant is, is, a, is almost a medical curiosity but death from a fatal pulmonary embolism with somebody with a high score is a real event. So in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with a saying that comes from my uh, dear friend in, in Maine. And he, he came up with this and he said, Joe, with your risk assessment, you wanna remember this, never kill a friend, never treat a stranger. Well, what do you mean about that? Well, performing a thorough history and physical gives you knowledge about your patients as if they were your good friend. And of course you would never hurt a friend and you would never kill a stranger. I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for uh, uh, inviting me, including Lowell Kabnick. It's a great honor to be with all of you. I appreciate any feedback, especially constructive comments, uh, constructive criticism. Please visit any of my social media platforms and all of you stay safe and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.